Welcome everyone. Today's topic is uh, property management. Okay, it's a very important topic, oftentimes disregarded by most investors. So we're going to dive into it and tell you the pros, the cons. When should you self-manage? When should, should you engage a professional property management company? And which one should that be? Okay, but before we dive into the topic, are there any questions, specific questions? Anything that uh, you would like to to discuss or need answers for? I have a question, Hugo. Yes, Rudy. I'm, I'm looking at a house that's on Humble Park. Okay. It has five bedrooms and three baths, full baths. Okay. When I put it, when I pull it up on Chicago Deal Board or, or uh, Zillow, it shows up as four bedrooms, one bath. Okay. How do, how will I do a ARV on this? If I'm going to do the cam mm -hmm. side. Uh, is this MLS off market pre foreclosure? What type of lead is this? It's an off market deal. Um, do you have the owner's contact information? Have you have you been in touch with the owner? I've talked to the owner and she told me, Rudy, I got uh, four bedrooms, actually five bedrooms, two in the top. It's a bungalow. It's in uh, West Humble Park area. Okay. And she says uh, she has another room in the basement. So it's five bedrooms and three baths. Okay. So but technically, go ahead. How, how would you do something like that? I mean, when I'm going to do a comp, do, because if it only shows up as four bedrooms and one bath, that means that it's that's the way it was recorded originally. So if I buy it or, 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 or something happens, uh, how do you go about it? I mean, you're, yeah, you're, you, you have, right. No, that's a great question. So the problem is that many people count lower like basement bedrooms as legal bedrooms they're not so you even in the mls you have to be specific if they are below ground level because they are they don't add value to the property right so technically bedrooms that are at the ground level or higher are counted as legal bedrooms they all need to have a closet window egress window so that is why many bedrooms in the basement are, are not legal because they don't have um uh, they just partition the basement. So they don't have a closet or even if they do, they don't have an acres window. It's not the right size. It's not a livable space, right? So to be considered a bedroom. So that's that. So that is why when you pull comps, you cannot take into account bedrooms below ground level. Okay. Now okay. bathrooms, yeah, it's a different story. So if it has, Two bathrooms, yes. Even if it's in the basement, you can count that as a, as a bathroom. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. And then, uh, so when we pull the comps, then we should take uh, four bedrooms. Four to, uh, you shouldn't count five, just four bedrooms, max. Minimum four, maximum four. And then bathrooms go anywhere between one and two. One and two, okay. Yeah, bathrooms. And we can help you pull those comps. All right. I'll. I'll I'll call you another day for that. We'll do Absolutely. It. Send us the address. We can do a soft uh, title pool on the property so that you you understand what you're getting into. So you're going to be able to, to see transaction history, tax information, uh, everything. So we can we can do that for you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. No problem. Uh, any any other uh, any other questions? Anybody? Anything that is holding you back? Okay, if not, let's dive into the topic. Property management. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes investors make is that they want to take on the property management themselves. So they want to self-manage the properties. And not only that, but oftentimes they ask me, how many properties do I need to own before I engage a property management company? Well, the answer should be one, the minute you have a rental property, you should engage a property management company. Now, let's talk about the benefits of uh, 
using a property management company and why you should not engage in self-managing your, your own rentals. Now, let me ask you this. Um, people on the line, do you self-manage properties today? Anybody self-managing their own rentals? Um, okay, so if you're not, that's a good thing. If you don't, uh, if you're not doing that, that's amazing. So let me tell you why you should not, because you need to understand the tenant landlord ordinance, and especially if you're in the in the city of Chicago, uh, you've got to understand the latest um, landlord tenant ordinance. They all favor tenants. So if you are not aware a hundred percent of the landlord tenant ordinance, you're asking for big time trouble. So the, the tenant actually can sue you and uh, it could be extremely expensive uh, when you are not using the right lease, when you are not using the right disclosures, when you are not keeping a uh, security deposit in a separate account, uh, when you're not giving them a receipt when you collect their earnest money, I mean the security deposit, <laughs> when you when they move out, you have uh, 30 days to send them in writing. Um, anything that was taken out from the security deposit, um, like damages, and then you have 45 days to return the security deposit back to the tenant. Uh, there are many more um, things that you need to understand. So if you are, if you do not know, and you shouldn't be expected to know this, you have to engage a property management company. Not only that, but you need to spend your time where you're gonna be making money in real estate. And that's talking to sellers, talking to listing agents, making offers. That's what's gonna make you money. Getting phone calls and talking to tenants, it's just, a waste of time not only that but it could be really really annoying especially if you get phone calls from the in the middle of the night for a leaky toilet um, that all needs to be handled by a third-party company not only that but what about rent collection right are you going to be knocking on the door are you going to be checking your bank account to see if they deposited the checks and then if they did not deposit what are you going to do so after five days, are you gonna issue the five day notice? Will you have the right format to send the five day notice? Will you send a server to actually deliver the five day notice properly so that, I, that, that it could be enforceable in court? Should you pursue an eviction? When should you pursue an eviction? There are so many questions, right, that you shouldn't be expected to know the answers. You shouldn't be expected to be on top of collection, okay? Uh, that's what the property management company is gonna do. Not only that, but oftentimes, you know, people buy a rental and they just uh, collect the rent and they forget about renewing the leases, right? What about rent increases? Should you have a one-year lease or a two-year lease, right? So these are things that property management companies are gonna handle for you successfully. And now, my my experience with property management companies is that um, I had a hard time finding the right property management company. Um, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because um, the way their revenue stream is set up. So a property management company is gonna tap into a percentage of the rental income. It's anywhere between eight, seven to 10%. Okay, I, I had a problem with that because we have mostly yearly leases and we tend to increase the rent every single year. So we didn't feel comfortable increasing our expenses as well for property management, okay? And then the second thing that we did not like is the fact that um, they were charging a normal a leg for repairs, maintenance, because when they get tenants, um, complaints and, and requests for repairs, they dispatch their own crew. So we were just looking at the bills and, and it was just insane, right? And, but I understood that's one of their main revenue streams, maintenance. 
not so much the percentage they charge on the rent, they make the most money on repairs, okay? Because they have their uh, in-house maintenance crew that they dispatch uh, and they, they make really good money on that. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to find a company that, uh, that could do everything, taking phone calls, manage rent collection, lease renewals, and so forth. However, I didn't want them to tap into a percentage of my rental income. Not only that, I wanted to control expenses on the upkeep of the properties. So we were able to find uh, Secure Pay One, that's the name of the company, and I'll share the contact information uh, in just a second. It's our preferred uh, partner uh, for property management. So we give them a list of contractors. So we have a list depending on what the issue is, from appliances, plumbing, electric, uh, regular maintenance, so that they can dispatch resource number one, let's say for plumbing. If that is not available, we have resource number two. So we share this contractors list with the property management company so that they dispatch the right individual that we know, we trust, and that we're gonna know uh, repairs are gonna be under budget. And not only that, but um, we don't need to always approve everything, except if uh, an expense or repair is gonna be over, I believe 350, then we, we step in just for an approval. But other than that, they have, the, they're empowered to take, to make decisions and uh, get things done. So that's one of the successful um, steps that we have taken towards freeing a lot more time, right? Because even if you have one rental, you have to engage a professional property management company that um, you can control expenses for repairs and that they don't have to necessarily tap into your rental income, okay? Um, we pay $50 per door and uh, obviously we pay directly the contractors being used. So that's been an amazing win-win for, for everyone. Now, let me tell you, uh, we have a couple of properties, especially single family homes um, that we've done everything on the property. So everything is pretty much brand new uh, from kitchen, bathroom, flooring, um, some electric plumbing, so we decided to leverage from our back-end Chicago Deal resources to self-manage those properties, especially uh, when the rents are greater uh, than 1,500, the quality of the tenants is gonna be very good. Uh, so we don't have any problems collecting rent and we're self-managing few properties that are pretty much in great condition, okay? And we have great tenants and they're in great neighborhoods. B, B plus, A minus neighborhoods uh, where the tenants are just amazing, right? So in those, in those particular cases, we're leveraging from our backend deal resources. So we have a, uh, a software that allows us to keep track of uh, everything that I was mentioning from lease renewals to maintenance tickets. And it's, it's been very simple because we, we have, we get a phone call every so often, every, perhaps two, three months, okay? So it's been super, super easy uh, to self-manage some of those properties. We also have uh, two, three, four flats. Those for sure we, we, uh, we will not manage because when you are into the multi-unit asset type, there's gonna be a higher turnover, okay? So you're gonna have more tenants moving in and out and then the rents are not gonna be as high as a single family home. Therefore, the quality of the tenants is not the same as the one for single family homes. Therefore, we always engage a property management company to manage multi-units. Two to four, they have to be self, uh, professionally managed. Now let's talk about something. Um, there's a question on the line. Do property management companies assist in finding and screening tenants? Um, great question. Uh, not all of them, some of them do because um, some of them just focus only on managing the property. 
some of them have uh, brokers in-house, so they'll be able to assist finding and screening tenants. So now that's a great question. Uh, before obviously you engage a property management company, you have to advertise a property. Uh, now, how are you gonna do that? How are you gonna attract top collectible tenants, okay? Pretty much, if you have a great product, a great property, apartment, that's going to drive higher quality tenants in a nutshell. You're gonna be able to collect higher rents. And right now, uh, we have a very, very strong rental market, okay? Now, when it comes to screening tenants, how do you go about that? Okay, so uh, number one, rule that we follow is uh, you have to run a background check on all your tenants and that includes a credit check okay eviction check and um, employment is not 100 percent necessarily because we're gonna we're gonna check um, their income through pay stubs and then making sure that those match their bank statements okay uh, now, what is it that you need to look for in a background check? Okay, so something that we look for are criminal records. Okay, we've seen anywhere from uh, speeding tickets all the way to weapon possessions, narcotics. Um, so you have to make a call, right? Um, when they have, you know, misdemeanors, it's not a big deal. But if they if they've been uh, you know, sentenced, and uh, they have criminal background records, then uh, it's, you know, it, it's a big, big risk, right? Because you, you don't want to have a drug house in your single family home, right? So you have to be very careful and thoroughly look at the background check. Now, as far as the credit, right? Some tenants don't have the best FICO score. However, um, we tend to look at time frames, right? Have they been paying on time in the last two, one to two years, right? Maybe they had some financial issues two, three years ago, but are they getting back on their feet, right? Have they been paying on time for the last 24 months? You need to look at patterns, right? Uh, because some tenants or prospective tenants are working on their credit. Not only that, some of them that may not have the best FICO score, they have a really good job, okay? Uh, we used to have a tenant whose FICO score was um, somewhere in the five, 500 or so. However, she was a manager at a, a bank, okay? So she was making over 90,000. So you cannot just look at the FICO score and say, no, you need to look at the overall picture because uh, income is the main factor when determining uh, whether you're gonna be collecting rent or not, okay? Uh, so she turned out to be an amazing tenant. And the reason why her FICO was so low is because she went through divorce a few years ago. And then uh, I guess things were jointly uh, purchased and then uh, they just didn't pay and it was just a bitter situation. That is why her FICO score was so low, but she was very responsible and she had a great job. So you, you have to be able to look at the overall uh, situation of the tenant. So something that is very critical and many investors oversee is that uh, you cannot discriminate against, uh, we have seven protected classes, sex, religion, national origin, uh, source of income. Uh, oftentimes, um, people discriminate against section eight, okay? Uh, that's a protected class, source of income. And uh, oftentimes, the government is gonna send testers, right? They're gonna call you, they're gonna inquire about the property, and they're gonna say, oh, by the way, do you take section eight vouchers? And if you say no, then you're gonna be in trouble because it's a protected class, especially if you are a licensee. If you have a real estate broker's license, it's a big deal. It's a protected, protected class that you, you cannot discriminate. 
Now, many people, for whatever reason, they don't like Section 8. And it's a myth because Section 8, it's just a great type of tenant because they've been screened, they've been, uh, they have been checked, their background check. So they're really great tenants. Not only that, but you're going to have your money on time. And on top of it, uh, something that I do like is that they do yearly inspections um, and that helps the upkeep of the property. So if they find issues, then you've got to address them, which, you know, we don't have a problem because that helps keep the property value high, okay? Um, the only drawback uh, that I see with uh, Section 8 vouchers is that uh, when it comes to rent increases, they will either not give you a rent increase or they may give you a very small percentage, okay? So once you rent to a Section 8 tenant, then it's very hard to increase the rent to make it uh, what the market is demanding. And the second drawback is that once you sign the papers, right, to get a tenant, they need to schedule an inspection. And oftentimes, depending on the county, it may take two, three weeks for the inspector to come to your property, check, check the premises, if everything goes okay, then they can uh, sign the lease and then they can schedule the moving date. So even though we were interested in uh, Section 8 tenant, for whatever reason, the inspection was taking too long and we, by the time we got the inspector in the property, we had already found another great tenant, okay, that was not Section 8 voucher. So it has its pros and cons, okay, just the length the inspection may take, uh, you know, because you don't want to end up with a vacancy. Uh, that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, but again, Section 8, great tenants uh, to work with. And they really need to uh, be a good tenant because otherwise uh, they may risk losing their voucher. And it's a big deal, right? Because um, oftentimes they get brand free <laughs> through the voucher. It's an amazing benefit, okay? Um, are there any other questions on the tenant screening? Hey, go. Hey, Sam. Uh, I have a question regarding the rent. Who who established the rent? I mean, if somebody has a fourteen hundred dollar voucher and I'm asking eighteen hundred for my unit, then what happens? Uh, two other four hundred a difference. So great question, Sam. Uh, so technically, legally, you cannot take money uh, outside of the voucher. Okay, so if they have a voucher for fourteen hundred and your rent is eighteen hundred, and the tenant says, "I'm willing to pay four hundred out of pocket on the side," uh, technically you should not do that because they have been uh, assessed in their financial situation. So that's the most they're able to to afford, right, or qualify for based on their family members. Um, so when you start, let's say if you were to say, okay, yes, you can pay 400 out of pocket, uh, then you're tapping into income that it's not meant for housing, right? It's meant for living expenses. So the issue is that if you were to have issues with the tenant, you cannot enforce the 1800. Most you can collect is 1400. So you sign the lease, you cannot sign the lease for 1800 because uh, Section 8, the Housing Authority, will not allow you. So you have to sign a lease for $1,400. Uh, and that's a problem, right? Because for refinancing purposes, right, if you have a really low rent, it's not going to make your debt coverage ratio work uh, in your favor. And then you cannot enforce the $1,800. And they might move in today and they say, you know what, I'm not going to pay you $1,800. I'm just going to continue paying the 1400 it's not enforceable so but typically that's the issue when they are because they have a voucher uh, based on their number of bedrooms and that's driven by their family size so if it's let's say a single family mom with one or two kids she will be approved for a two-bedroom voucher 
if they have more kids or a bigger family, three bedroom, four bedroom. So the price rent goes up according to the size of the of the housing. But again, so you have to be super careful not to make side agreements outside of the voucher because it's non-enforceable. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I can refuse them because the rent I'm asking is not equal of their uh, voucher. Exactly, exactly. So the voucher, the voucher does not qualify for the rent. So that's a good, good question. What can you discriminate against? There's only one thing that you can discriminate, and that is against financials. Okay. Um, so if they do not make enough income to afford the housing, that's a reason to say no. Unfortunately, you do not qualify. Okay. Um, so there's a rule of thumb. Take the rent. It's super simple, and that's that's how we screen tenants even before we schedule the showing, okay? Take the rent and multiply it by 40, and that should be the yearly income. So let me give you an example. If the rent is $1,000 per month, multiply these times 40, which means they need to make at least 40,000 a year. If they don't make 40,000 a year, they cannot afford to pay a hundred, I mean, $1,000 per month. That's that's a great rule of thumb, rule of thumb. okay? Um, so we go by that. So let's say if the rent is 1,500, they have to make 60,000. If they don't make 60,000, then you cannot rent to, to those individuals because uh, that takes into account about a 32 to 35% uh, towards housing. So once, once, um, the yearly income is below, then you're sort of getting them to spend over 35% in housing, and that is not realistic. They will struggle because not only do they have to pay for the rent, they have to pay for gas. If it's a house, single family home, they have to pay for, for everything gas, electric, water, landscape, for lawn care, and snow removal. So that's that's a big problem, okay? It's not only the rent, but also everything that comes with the maintenance of the property. If it's a, a condo or a multi-unit, then there's a little bit more flexibility because you as the landlord, you're gonna be paying for water, you might be paying for common gas, you might be paying for common electric. So they're gonna be paying um, a smaller utility bill per se. But again, you have to follow this rule multiply the rent times 40 and that should be the yearly income that's the first thing that we do when we screen tenants uh before even we find out about the fico when we get on the phone and they say oh hello i'm interested in your listing or your rental in uh, let's say uh hanover park we're gonna say okay that sounds great um may I ask you a few questions what's your yearly income and if they say fifty-five thousand when indeed they should be making 60,000. Uh, the next question is, how is your credit, okay? What's your FICO score? So if their FICO score is over 650, there's a still, you know, there's a direct correlation between how responsible these people are paying their bills on time and their FICO score. So if their FICO score is over 650, we may consider that, but that's pushing it, right? So we are super, super strict as to making sure they make 40 times their rent, okay? So if they make 60,000, by all means, we'll, we'll arrange the showing. However, if they make only 50,000, we're gonna tell them right up front, I'm sorry, but uh, you need to make at least, six, and we're gonna tell them, you need to make at least 60,000 uh, to be able to qualify for the rental. And the reason why is because we wanna make sure that you can afford the housing, okay? And, and not put pressure on your living expenses. And then you can also find out how much they're currently paying and why they're moving out, right? So those are key questions to ask the tenants. Why are you moving out? For how long were you living in your last apartment or house? Okay, you want to find out if they've been 
let's say only for six months in their previous apartment or house or for a couple of years. So if they've been there for a long term, that's good, thumbs up. If they've been there for let's say six months, whoa, that's a red flag, what happened? And they typically like to blame the landlord, right? Uh, so you really need to do due diligence. So you have to check references, meaning you have to call the landlord and ideally the previous landlord. But again, right? Uh, if you were to call the landlord and they want to get rid of them, do you think they're going to tell the truth and say, no, it's a horrible tenant, they're behind the rent? No, because they want to get rid of the tenant, right? And also, if a landlord gives a bad, uh, not review, but a bad reference about the tenant, they can get in trouble. Because if the landlord causes the tenant not to get a new place, uh, then the landlord, the previous landlord, can get in trouble. So it's, it's just really hard. You, you really need to assess income, right? Make sure they, they can afford it. You need to check uh, how responsible they've been paying their bills on time in the last two years. And uh, also something that is important, uh, pets, okay? Let's not forget about pets because pets could be a big deal. <laughs> uh, so let me tell you where pets come into the picture. Personally, we, we're okay with uh, cats, perhaps some sm small dogs, uh, but when it comes to dogs, there is a list of, of vicious, vicious uh, breeds. Like, uh, I don't know, I don't, I'm not familiar with dogs, but some that, I can, that can come to my mind are like the Bulldog, uh, Doberman, and there are so many, Akira. So they're very, very vicious dogs. And the problem with that is that even if you have um, insurance, they have clauses where they will not pay out of claim if there's a vicious dog in the premises, okay? If something wants to happen, uh, even if they get a renter's insurance, right? There's a disclosure that if you own a vicious dog, they will just not pay out a claim. So you have to be super, super careful with the breed of the dog, okay? So when, when we check the list for vicious dogs and they happen to have that one, it's a big no-no, okay, for uh, liability purposes. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And then there are other pets, right? Like uh, I've seen tenants that they, they wanna bring like a zoo to their house. They have lizards, uh, snakes, and all of that. I mean, we just don't feel comfortable with it. Okay, so something to keep in mind, pets. Um, and then if you decide to go ahead with a pet, you have two options. You can charge a non-refundable pet fee or pet deposit, or you can also charge pet rent, okay? Anywhere between $25 to $50 for a pet. And as far as uh, pet deposit, could be anywhere between $300 to $500, okay? So it's up to you, but just be careful if you're gonna take pets because certain pets are going to ruin the property. They may scratch the flooring, the doors. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when screaming tenants. And also something to keep in mind is that every adult over 18 years old has to be on the lease, okay? That is super important because if you end up doing an eviction, guess what? Uh, if there's one individual that is an adult and is not on the lease, that can halt or that can delay the eviction, right? You've got to make sure that every single occupant is on the lease, okay? You need to make sure they're not subletting or that uh, they're bringing more people into the property, obviously because of the wear and tear and uh, because legally you, can, you cannot evict all of them, okay? They'll, be considered sort of like squatters and then that's a big problem <laughs> uh, so you, you just need to make sure that uh, the housing is meant for the number of occupants that are applying for it okay there's another question on the line are there any preferred companies you use for background and credit checks yes so we use uh, rentapplication.net and my smart move that's from transunion smart move and rentapplication.net the most common one is my smart move, okay? 
they typically they typically charge about forty dollars for a background check, and then you get a link, and then you send the link to the prospective tenant. So they pay that fee online, and they pay that to TransUnion, and then you just get the results back. Okay, so my smart move and uh, rentapplication.net. Okay, so those are, those are two great websites where you're gonna get background checked, uh, credit check, eviction check, or oh, eviction. We've seen a lot of uh, evictions in their in their background check, and that's a big no-no. Okay. If somebody has been evicted, uh, there is no possible way we are going to lease the unit to somebody who's been evicted, okay? Uh, so something, again, that's personal, but you have to keep that in mind. You need to make that call. Um, and do you charge an application fee? So we don't. It's paid by, by the tenant to the... Uh, like TransUnion or rentapplication.net, wherever you end up using, they're gonna pay them. So I don't wanna be in charge of collecting uh, rent application fees, okay? Because that could be, I know some landlords, what they do is they just start collecting uh, application fees and sometimes they already know, right? That they, they won't rent to those tenants, they just wanna make money off of uh, other people. And they could get in trouble, right? Because uh, that's, sort of like stealing other people's money. And I've heard cases where, you know, police is gonna get involved if, if uh, landlords engage in that scheme. Uh, so yeah, you don't want to collect any application fees. Let them pay on the link from my smart move or rent application, okay? You, you don't wanna collect that. And then the other question is, uh, you mentioned looking for rent, uh, rent patterns when doing a background check where do you look for that oh okay great question so you when you check when you see the report for the uh credit check you're gonna see if they have been late uh let's say on a credit card or on an installment loan let's say a car loan um if they were late in the last 30 days 60 days 90 days uh, if they missed a payment. So you're gonna see that on the report. So if you see that everything has been paid on time for the last 12, 24 months, then it's thumbs up, right? Maybe they had a hardship uh, three years ago. It's okay. As long as you see the pattern that in the last uh, 12 months to 24 months, they've been paying everything on time. And we've seen the opposite, right? They were great, they had a great FICO score and then all of a sudden they started missing payments, right? They, they were late on credit cards, installment uh, student loans or car loans. So we wanna find out why. Why is it that uh, you've been late on that? So that's a red flag. And also some tenants or prospective tenants uh, earn cash, right? So they don't have a pay stub you have to be careful with that because that means that it's not guaranteed income and that could jeopardize uh, collecting rent from them, okay? So we don't favor tenants who just get cash, okay? That, that's, that's too risky. We want somebody who can prove, right, that they make a certain amount of income and uh, oftentimes we will ask for uh, tax returns, right? So we want to understand um, exactly where they stand income-wise. Uh, but out of the box, what are the documents that you're going to request? State ID, uh, pay stops, bank statements, okay? Uh, those are three key documents, especially uh, bank statements. A bank statement is going to tell you how promptly they pay the rent, okay? Uh, it's either via check, Zelle, or cash, whatever, however they pay, you wanna see when they pay the rent today, because that's gonna be an indication when they're gonna pay you uh, for the rent, whether, whether they're gonna be on time, late. Uh, so that's something uh, important to check, okay? Bank statements. Now, pay stops. Uh, there was one prospective tenant that uh, that gave us a fake pay stub. 
Uh, so that was because, you know, the, the way we found that is because we were matching the pay stubs with the bank statements and we just could not find a match for that. So by taking a closer look at the pay stub, we realized it was a fake pay stub. Um, and there's, a, there's an option that you can also check employment, um, but we didn't need to go that far. We realized it was a, a fake pay stub. Uh, I mean, that only happened once, um, but I'm just sharing uh, our experiences. Always check pay stubs, bank statements, state ID. Okay, and make sure that you have a complete list of all the occupants for the premises, including children. Okay, but adults over 18 years old have to be in the lease. Okay, now there's another question. If we rent uh, to three people and later on, the, uh, on a fourth person is living in the apartment, do we charge more in rent? Uh, no, you can. Uh, okay, so great question. Once you have a contract, right, which is a lease agreement, and by the way, the lease agreement supersedes the sales contract, which means that um, if you end up selling your property and the tenant still has a lease, that supersedes the sales contract. If, if, you buy, if somebody buys a property from you today, but the tenant will not or will not have to move out, they can stay for the duration of the lease. Uh, but to answer your question, if you have three people on the lease, right, and they end up having a fourth person on the lease, then at that point, they have breached the contract. And that's that's a reason for you to uh, technically evict the tenant. Will you do that? Probably not, right? Um, so you need to make sure that one, they're added on the lease. If you allow that, uh, or if not, uh, another option is to increase the rent, right? And, but you will need to put that in writing. So you might need to have an addendum to the lease that you are adding, let's say, a fourth adult, and the rent now is going to be increased by $50 or whatever, right? Because there's going to be more wear and tear, right? Especially if you're paying some of the utilities. Uh, that's something to be considered, right? Uh, it's very, very critical. And not only that, but uh, it's not only about collecting more rent, but it's about also checking their background check, okay, and credit and everything, especially if they're going to be contributing towards the rent. Because maybe that fourth individual may be a drug dealer, right? So who cares if they pay $50 extra in rent, right? That could be a big deal. That could be a big disaster, right? Uh, because that fourth individual can bring gang members or it can cause troubles uh, with other tenants in the unit or neighbors. So you have to be super, super careful. If all of a sudden there's a fourth person on the picture, uh, okay guys, so that's not our, our agreement. We've got to check their background check. We've got to do everything that we did for the, for the three adults uh as number one and then if everything works okay if everything looks fine then you negotiate a rent increase or maybe you let them stay right because maybe it's it's an individual that doesn't will not contribute towards the rent but they have good credit they have a clean background check so perhaps you just let it go right if they're good tenants a fourth person is not going to make a difference right but you do need to screen that fourth individual okay uh, especially if they're going to be contributing towards the rent, right? That's going to be super critical because let's assume that um, that fourth person is going to contribute towards 50% of the rent for whatever reason. You have to know that. Therefore, you need to know their income. You've got to get everything that you did for the previous people. You need to do that all over again. So it's not about only increasing the rent. It's making sure you put it in writing on the lease as a writer or you rewrite the lease and you determine if you increase the rent. But again, you don't want the rotten apple to be that fourth person, right? Because then if you have a rotten apple, uh, everything could collapse, uh, okay? So it's, there's more to, to, to it than just increasing the rent. Does that make sense, Veronica? Yes, thank you. No problem. Uh, are there any other questions? 
about screening tenants. Uh, let me quickly share with you some of the documents and agreements that we that we use. Uh, so in Chicago Deal Vault, we have uh, a section that says contracts and documents. And in here, you can pick the rental forms, okay? So we have a rental application right here. Um, so you can have them fill this out or you can send them directly to the website. So what we do is um, we like to have all their contact information, uh, but if they fill everything out online, then you have a digital version of it. If not, uh, you can still have them fill out an application form. Then we have the lease, uh, residential lease. Now, super important, the lease for, for the city of Chicago is different than this, the lease for, for the suburbs because the landlord uh, tenant ordinance in the city of Chicago is completely different. So you have to have two types of leases. Um, now, if you're a real estate broker, then you have to have an, an agency disclosure that you specify to the prospective tenant that you are a real estate broker, that you are not representing them. So it's a non-disclosure agency agreement. Uh, so this is, so the first lease is for Chicago. We have residential lease too. This is for the suburbs. Uh, we have some disclosures that you always have to include in the paperwork. One of them is the lead-based paint, especially if your property was built before 1978. If your property is new construction, you don't have to have the lead-based paint disclosure, but if it's built before 1978, you do have to have these. Uh, mall disclosure, radon disclosure. Radon disclosure does not apply to properties or, or condos that are on the third level and higher up. Okay, radon is a gas that comes from the ground. So typically this affects properties or basements, especially first floor up to second floor. Anything above the third level, you don't have to worry about mall disclosure. If you have a condo in a high rise or mid rise, uh, lead-based paint, you have to include the lead-based paint uh, brochure. Lead, uh, and then we have a couple of addendums, uh, like the crime-free crime -free addendum. Some villages are going to require you to take a crime-free course, and that could be in-person or online, okay? Uh, they just want to make sure that uh, you're properly screening the tenants, that you have the proper uh, disclosures in place, because they want to make sure that you don't turn your rental into like a drug house, okay? So uh, some villages have this crime-free addendum that you have to include to the lease, okay? And some villages are going to want to have a copy of the lease uh, that you have with the tenants because some villages will require you to have a rental license. And to get a rent rental license, you have to provide a copy of the lease, addendums, making sure that everything is uh, in order, okay, and that you run a background check on your tenants. So some villages are going to be very strict uh, before you can get a rental license. What else do we have? Uh, lease addendum, utilities, and, and okay, so in here, in the lease, you're going to specify, so I'm going to open up a lease because in the lease, you're going to specify uh, who pays for what, right? That's something very, very important to specify uh, like utilities, right? So number 28, who's paying for electric, uh, water, gas, uh, fuel, uh, snow removal, association and so forth. Um, so that's something that you need to, to keep in mind, uh, security deposit, right? Uh, so you have to be super careful, especially in the city of Chicago when it comes to security deposit. I know that some landlords have gone the route of just taking a non-refundable moving fee because they don't want to deal with the hassle of the landlord tenant ordinance to keep uh, the deposit, right? Because you have to put it in escrow, you have to give them interest, you have to return the security deposit after uh, 45 days that, uh, after they move out. So there, there are a lot of rules around the security deposit. So you just have to be super, super careful. That is why when you engage a professional management company, they're going to handle this the right way, okay? Um, what else? Use sublet assignments. So obviously you don't want to allow uh, the tenants to sublet the unit to somebody else. 
possession alternations, they always have to check with you on any changes to be made to the property, maintenance and repairs, um, damage. Uh, something that is important in the uh, when you rent to somebody um, a tenant that you require them to have renters insurance. Okay, that is super super important. They have to give you a copy of the renters insurance policy, and those are very inexpensive. They're like less than 150 per year, so you always have to require that. Um, let me see if there's anything that that is important in here. Um, to talk about. So it's pretty straightforward, uh, but again, a property management, management company is gonna be in charge of uh, making sure they, uh, the tenant fills this out properly, so you don't even have to worry about this, but just in case we're giving you everything that you need uh, to have in writing with the tenant, including the disclosures, okay? Are there any questions so far on uh, the legal documents, disclosures, or anything? Uh, Hiko, uh, I have one, uh, two more questions. Yes. Uh, first, uh, this management company you have, uh, can they handle high-end uh, rental apartment, $3,000, $4,000 a month, close Absolutely. to downtown Chicago? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so let me share with you the property management company that we use, Prefer Partners, and then you need to go to uh, property, property management right here. So we've used a couple of them from here, uh, but the one that I personally like the most is SecurePay one, okay? But these are all great property management companies. So you can just talk to a couple of them just to get a feel for them, how they work. Um, but something to keep in mind when dealing with property management companies, uh, that is important. Three things, just to quickly summarize. One, uh, how much are they gonna charge, right? We just like to pay a flat fee versus a percentage of the rent. Number two, uh, they need to give you a list of expected uh, repair costs, right? In our particular case, we like to use our own crew of maintenance of handyman, right? So that we can control the cost. And then number three, uh, how quickly will they deposit the rent collected into your account? Some property management companies, they typically do that once a month, let's say towards the end, mid, mid, mid-month or towards the end. We like a property management company that the minute they get the money from the tenant goes into our account, right? That's super important. Okay, so so the, those are the three main points that you need to find out from the property management company. Okay. Uh, oh, quick question. Uh, property management company, are they also in charge of charging the late fees? Absolutely. So great question, Veronica. And that, that is why I love uh, engaging a professional property management because I wouldn't be able to enforce late fees. I mean, sometimes, you know, you would need to be checking your bank account to make sure that they paid on time. So they will be on top of it. And if they don't pay on time, not only will they be able to enforce late fees, but they're going to issue the five day notice on time. Uh, which is critical because then you're sending them a message. This is a business. This is not charity. We made an agreement. Uh, you've got to pay on time. And if you don't, you know, we're going to take you to the next step. Okay. So the way we do it is we always uh, tell the property management company to issue the five day notice. Now, the way we do it is we send it via regular mail. Okay. And then if they have not paid by mid month, uh, obviously, we're going to try to find out the reason, but if we don't hear back from the tenant, we're going to send, uh, we're going to have the property management company send a server uh, to give them the five day notice. So they're going to actually knock on the door and boom, serve them the five day notice because that's going to be enforceable uh, should we take it to the next level, uh, meaning to the court, through the court system in an eviction proceeding. Now, if, you, if you're gonna do an eviction, uh, that's gonna cost you about a flat fee of 600. 
And then uh, filing fees are gonna be anywhere between 200 or 200 to 300. Let me see if we have uh, eviction and collections, okay? So I hope you don't have to use this resource, okay? I hope you don't have to come to this point, okay? Uh, I mean, worst case scenario, you're better off doing a cash for keys or you don't want to go through the eviction process, especially today, because there's a backlog of pending evictions, okay? So an eviction, especially, in the city of Chicago can take up to six, eight months. So you don't want to go that route, okay? It's best to minimize your loss and uh, tell them, okay, we, <laughs> uh, I'm willing to just call it even, but I need possession of the premises, right? Uh, you don't want to engage in an eviction proceeding. Uh, are there any other questions? So the, the flat fee that they charge is normally $50 a month for any kind of rent? Uh, yeah, that's, the, that's, that's how much we pay, 50 per door. We control the budget by them using our handyman and uh, we expect them to transfer the rent as soon as they get it over to our uh, account. So if they use their own sources, they may uh, just add some surcharge to the bill for uh, for the company, right? Yes, correct. Uh, Hugo, did you have any case that uh, Section 8 forced you to accept lower rate? For example, after inspection, they come and say, this apartment doesn't worth 1,800, it worth 1,500. Um, so you, yeah, you we cases, yeah, and it's up to us to accept it. We're gonna say no. Uh, because they go off of the market, but sometimes we say no, it's too low, or sometimes they get downgraded, uh, like from a three voucher to a two voucher, and then obviously they won't be able to sign a lease for the same amount. So we say, No, I'm sorry, uh, the rent is this much, and they'll have to move out. Okay, so you they cannot force you, correct? Okay, great, no, thank you. No problem. Cash for keys, can I use that as a tax write off? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Cash for keys. And we have that agreement uh, as well. I believe is we have it in here. Uh, rental, purchase. Um, we do have a cash for keys agreement. Oh, right here. Cash for keys is the last one. Okay, so I hope you don't ever have to do this, but uh, we do have a cash for keys agreement here in Chicago Deal World. Okay, so uh, I hope that uh, you learned a lot today and uh, that you always engage a property management company, okay? That's, that's something that you don't want to take on, okay? For sure. I highly advise that you don't do property management company, even if you own one single rental, okay? You always have to use the experts. That's one of the worst jobs to have, right? You don't wanna be hearing from tenants. I don't want to be hearing from tenants, uh, okay? So, um, no, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, please make sure we're gonna have a live event next Wednesday, December 1st, okay? Make sure that you come. We're gonna talk about wholesaling, uh, we're going to have Russell Walker, and we're going to have a great crowd. Um, so please make sure that you come next Wednesday, December 1st, uh, Oak Brook, okay, Double Tree Hotel. So I'll be looking forward to seeing you all, and uh, happy holidays, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you for joining today, and I look forward to making you more successful. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. 773-368-4551, that's my cell phone. Uh, if you need a call back, let me know. I'll be happy to touch base with uh, any of you, okay? So thank you everyone for joining. Happy Thanksgiving and uh, I'll see you next Wednesday, okay? I would love to shake your hand face to face. So thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, thank you. Um, likewise. Thank you, Hugo. Happy Thank you, Rudy. You and your family. Thank you. We'll see you next Wednesday. Yeah, see you next Wednesday, Rudy. Take I'll care. Bring some, bye bye. I'll bring some people with you. Perfect. Awesome. Bye bye, guys.